This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. Eating fresh lupins, performing intimate acts in public places and shouting at passers-by from inside a barrel is behaviour not normally associated with philosophy. But the cynics were different. They were philosophers determined to expose the meaningless of civilised life by action as well as by word. They slept rough, ignored personal hygiene, ate simply, and gave their lectures in the marketplace. Perhaps surprisingly, their ideas and attitudes were immensely popular in the ancient world. But how coherent was cynicism as a philosophy? What was its influence on literature and politics? And is there any truth to the contention that Jesus Christ himself was influenced by the cynics? With me to discuss the philosophy of cynicism is Angie Hobbs, lecturer in philosophy at the University of Warwick, John Moles, professor of Latin at the University of Newcastle, and Miriam Griffin, fellow in ancient history at Somerville College, Oxford. Angie Hobbs, cynicism, in common with so much philosophy from the ancient world, has its roots in Socrates. Can you explain which... How the how Socratic ideas made their way into cynicism? Yes, well, for Socrates, the good life is a life of self-sufficiency, and this is possible because uh, virtue is sufficient for happiness, and so uh, happiness and virtue are within your power. So such things as your social status, your sex, whether you're freeborn or slave, whether you're Greek or non-Greek, are irrelevant. Your external contingencies are, are by the by. Your happiness is up to you. And how did that key in and when did key in? Are we talking about the early cynics being contemporaneous with Socrates? Well, certainly the uh, first inspiration for the cynics uh, is thought to have been one of Socrates' associates called Antisthenes. And Antisthenes, again, he promotes these ideals of self-sufficiency and freedom uh, through rigorous mental and physical training. Once you get to Diogenes, um, who uh, comes after Antisthenes and who's the first cynic proper, what he does is say, yes, uh, self-sufficiency and freedom are what it's about, but to understand how to achieve these, you have to understand human nature um, because happiness is living in accordance with our rational understanding of nature, of our nature as as, uh, rational animals. So... uh, the knowing yourself is absolutely crucial. Now, what Diogenes then does is to say that human nature is often at odds with human society as we've uh, created it. So what we need to do is to try to rid ourselves of the unnecessary and unnatural desires which human society has instilled in us, free ourselves from those burdens, and live according to our simple, minimal, natural desires and do what we want, whenever we want, where we want, including eat, eating lupins. Miriam Griffin, Diogenes was called Diogenes the dog and cynicism as it takes its name from uh, the Greek word meaning dog. Why were they pleased to be associated with dogs? Well, the dog has always been associated in Greek literature right back to Homer with shamelessness. Uh, That is, not having a sense of shame and doing things in public which people are usually ashamed to do in public, like defecating and copulating and also scavenging for food. Um, Diogenes himself said uh, that he was a dog um, because he fawned on those he begged from, he yelped at those who wouldn't give him the money, and he bit the ankles uh, of those who were bad. And that's all doggish behavior. Um, And we're told that at a banquet, people threw him bones as if he were a dog, and so he replied in kind and uh, urinated all over them. Um, But this is a way of saying, I'm not bound by social conventions. Um, Quite dramatic. Though, I just it? live in a completely <laughs> natural way. Uh, yes, exactly. I mean, anything that you can do, you can do in public. But the, uh, it's interesting, though, isn't it? Because he's saying, why are you worried about us doing this in public when you're not worried about people, greed, people killing each other? It, it, he's making more, more of a statement than an exhibition of himself, isn't he? Could you develop that? Yes. I mean, I think there is a serious point to this. Um, I mean, what was often said of them was that they... Uh, deface the currency. And what they mean by that is they take ordinary social conventions, ordinary social values, and you despise them and show in action and in word that you have absolutely no respect for them. 
The, most, the story that everybody listening to this program will know about Diogenes is that he lived in a barrel. Alexander the Great came to visit him, as it were, and said, what do you want from me? And he said, stand aside so that I can see the sun. Now, what, why is that so important as a statement from Diogenes? And why did Alexander want to visit him, the man in the barrel? Well, that's, of course, a very good question. I mean, some people think that Alexander, who is reputed to have said, if I were not Alexander, I would like to be Diogenes, was thinking of both the physical toughness of Diogenes, but also his independence and the fact that he is in charge. That is, you can't do anything to him. He has power for rather different reasons from what Alexander has power. Alexander has kingly position and he has an army. Diogenes has power because you can't do anything to him. <coughs> Briefly, um, Diogenes famous, he's introduced, if I'm right, the word cosmopolitan into the Greek language. So was there something about Alexander and Diogenes in their philosophy of how the world should be seen that they had in common? Mm -hmm. This is a very difficult question because it's a question about Alexander as well as about Diogenes. And there are views about how cosmopolitan Alexander actually was uh, and whether he really thought that all his subjects should have access to positions of power or whether he always kept the Macedonians on top. Um, but some people feel that... Um, uh, he did have a certain liberal view, and if you're going to have an empire of that size, sooner or later you're going to have to rope in the elite of your subject peoples. Whether Diogenes had a positive cosmopolitan view is also a difficult one. We know that he said, in answer to the question, where do you come from, which is the standard Greek question to a stranger, um, I'm a citizen of the cosmos. I'm a citizen of the universe. I'm not a citizen of any particular Greek city. Can I turn now to, to John Mills to take that along? I mean, that, that is almost a, that is a political statement because being a citizen of a city is very important to be where you come from. That's why um, Miriam Griffin was saying it is the first question you ask matters to your identity. And he is saying, I will not be identified by that. So is that a way in for us to talk about any political significance as a philosophy that cynicism might have had? Yes, I, I think it is. Um, cynicism uh, pits itself absolutely against uh, all civilized values, and it pits itself against the city uh, and politics. It obviously rejects those absolutely, and it sort of appropriates the, the, this vocabulary and, uh, and uses it to describe uh, itself. In a way, it, it does a pun on the sort of word state. The state becomes the, uh, the state of being a cynic, the cynic in his moral or a philosophical st state, and uh, this has, uh, in a paradoxical way, it has political implications because the cynics simply don't play ball with the city-state or its activities at all. Uh, they opt out. They're against it. They criticize it. They try to make as many converts as possible. So that if, as cyn cynicism progresses, its alienation and challenge to the, to the, to, to the city becomes ever greater. And it's, it's not a case that you have a sort of standoff between politics and some sort of anemic moral thinking. The cynics, because they are anarchists in a strong sense, in, paradoxically become a political force. One of the most famous of the cynics was, was uh, Crates, who we are told was a, 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 a man of no great physical attraction whatsoever, but he was wooed by a virtuous maiden called Hipparchia. Is that how I pronounce it? That's right, That's yes. right, Hipparchia, a wealthy, virtuous, young maiden. Anyway, he gave in, and uh, they, they had an a, a infamous or famous and notorious but, but cynical Yes. Uh, marriage called the dog marriage, yes. which alienated Zeno. So yes. First, could we briskly have the dog marriage, and then what was the significance of alienating Zeno? Well, it's dealing with a crucial am ambiguity here. I mean, how do the cynics under understand marriage? From one point of view, it's a marriage. From from one po another point of view, it's just a sexual relationship entered into freely. Um, <clears throat> uh, the story is that Zeno came along and, and saw his master and this virtuous uh, virgin at it uh, uh, on the street, on, on, the, on the ground, and he was so horrified that he whipped off his own cloak, thereby making himself naked, uh, to cover them. And this is the moment of transition between cynicism and stoicism. Um, now, that story uh, can't be true, the story about Zeno, that is, and he would not have been offended by this because early stoicism accepts cynic sh shamelessness and behavior of that kind. But it's a way of dramatizing the shift from cynicism to stoicism. But it's certain that uh, uh, Hipparchia 
and and uh, Crates were a couple, and they had they had they had children, and what they were doing, what Crates was doing, was enacting very precisely one of uh, Diogenes' most famous. Uh, uh, claims which he made in his ideal state, a written work. He rejected marriage and he said uh, that the man who persuades should go with the woman who persuades. And this is free, consensual sex. And in ancient terms, of course, it's, it's, it's revolutionary and in a certain sense it's very admirable because it totally empowers the woman. Miriam Griffin, can you tell us how cynicism translated into Roman life, where we are told it was taken up by aristocrats and even senators, and, and yet they're being advised by people who are beggars in the marketplace who have nothing or anti-everything they stand for, wealth, possessions, material pursuits, and so on. But it did translate very strongly into Roman life, didn't it? That's quite true. Um, there are various changes that take place in the way the cynics behave, or certainly the way they're represented, uh, in the Roman sources. Um, I think what the Romans were attracted by was, first of all, the lack of theory. The Romans are a practical people, um, and they saw the point of ethics. They weren't too sure about physics and logic and these other branches of philosophy. The other thing they liked that went with that was that the cynics taught by example, and there is a very long Roman tradition uh, in which you take the ancestral example as a model for virtue. So the other thing is that the cynics had a kind of rhetoric of their own, a kind of eloquence, and this was uh, very much a satirical eloquence, and the Romans always thought of satire as their appropriate genre for expressing things. So they were very attracted by that. And finally, there was this kind of physical austerity and toughness uh, which the Romans prided themselves on and which their ancestors were all supposed to have lived as sort of um, uh, austere farmers. So I think there were a lot of attraction of, of cynicism for them, and I assume that these cynic philosophers um, fitted in very well. They knew they were there to set an extreme example of what human nature is capable of, but that there were certain things they had to eschew, and that was modesty... Uh, they had to observe the canons of modesty. They couldn't copulate in the street and do things of that kind. And even verbally, uh, there are some signs of more restraint in the Roman cynics. Angie Hobbs, we're, we're taking forward the idea of cynic cynicism into the Roman Empire, and the Roman cynic philosopher, the great one, was Demetrius. What were his, was he carrying on... Was he modifying, or what was he doing with the teachings of Diogenes? Yes, well, I think Demetrius is an excellent example of what Miriam has just been talking about, because what he does is highlight those aspects of Greek cynicism, which he feels uh, accord with traditional Roman virtues, such as hardiness and simplicity and self-control and, and honesty. Uh, and what he also does is try to kind of gloss over the uh, sh more shocking and uh, nefarious aspects of Diogenes' cynicism as not in keeping with, with Roman decency. Um, as so a Roman cynicism is, I'm going to get this right, Roman cynicism is a modification. They don't want the, the street behaviour. They don't well. want the street yeah. behaviour. They don't want the lunatic fringe. Um, and yet that is central to what Diogenes and those in I, their I, time I, oh, were absolutely, doing. Oh, absolutely, yes. absolutely. You know, the, the Romans, are, it, it, they're not exactly turning it into an original philosophy, but they are absolutely putting their own stamp on it. Um, to, to put this into context, there's a story that uh, the Greek philosopher Plato said that uh, Diogenes was Socrates gone mad. Now, you could look at what the Roman cynics are doing. They're trying to make a Roman cynic, uh, Diogenes, sort of gone sane again. Um, so, and as a result... Uh, Roman uh, Stoics have, find they have quite a lot in common with Roman cynics. So Roman Stoics like Seneca are able to befriend uh, the cynic Demetrius, and there's quite a lot of accord, um, both political and intellectual and emotional, between them. So we're getting a movement, if you like, of... Uh, to me, it seems as more of a convergence between cynicism and Stoicism in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD, though they don't quite meet. Miriam Griffin, can we talk about Seneca in that regard? Are we struggling to keep cynicism alive, as it were, compared with the power of Stoicism at that time? 
Well, that's a very interesting way of putting it, I think. Um, the problem is that they rather, the cynics rather disappear from the screen for a certain period before about the period of Seneca. That is, they're still talking about them, but we just don't know any particular figures. And then suddenly we begin to hear quite a lot about them. Um, I think the uh, role that uh, Andrew was mentioning, the relationship with Stoicism, is a very interesting one. Some of these features of cynicism um, answer the objections that the Romans felt about Stoicism, which was too theoretical. Um, they thought they didn't have any eloquence and expressed themselves in very talking about the Stoics, didn't they? Yeah. Uh, the Stoics in very difficult ways, whereas the Cynics didn't do that. John Mills, there's a, there's a, um, um, Epictetus wrote on cynicism at the end of the first century. Is he, is he taking the ideas of Diogenes forward or is he reinterpreting them? Well, this bears on the conversation that, we, that we've just had um, between M Miriam uh, and Angie. I mean, Epictetus uh, is a Greek. Of course, he's operating in the Roman context, and, and, he, and he teaches uh, Roman citizens and, and Roman senators in, in, his, in his school. Uh, and one of his uh, separate works uh, is on cynicism, and it's, and it's the single chunkiest discussion of cynicism that survi survives from the ancient world. And, and people are, aren't really very... Uh, clear how to read it. Is it sort of a stoicized view? Um, there's a very, very strong emphasis on the divine role of, of, of the cynic, which is, I think, alien to the original cynic perspective, and he's keen to get rid of the, of, of the shamelessness. He says, either they, they didn't do these acts, or you shouldn't do those acts. But there is also an intellectual analysis there. He homes in on one most characteristic idea of the cynic, that is the cynic uh, as the the scout or the spy, and when he's using this as, as a metaphor, the cynic sort of advances out from, from the normal com community and experiences the extremes of human toil and labor, and then he comes back and reports to the rest of us what it's like. So when he gets an intellectual analysis, I think myself that it's uh, rather an anemic and impoverished one compared with real cynicism. Yes, and I think we should be careful not to give the impression that cynicism is sort of um, um, monoform at this time, because it seems to me there are so many different kinds of, of uh, cynicism in the uh, Roman Empire, because as well as the more serious uh, adoptions of a certain lifestyle that we've been talking about, um, there are also sort of Roman aristocrats who are kind of attracted to cynicism because they see that it might be um, congenial to their desire to get rid of the um, imperial rule and to return to a republic. And then there are these intriguing stories, aren't there, of um, Roman professional men who practice their jobs sort of Monday to Friday, as it were, and then at the weekend um, sort of put on the garb, put on the cloak, uh, took up their staff, took their knapsack and went off being cynics for the weekend. Um, I mean, there's some interesting modern parallels there. So, <laughs> so we've got those sort of amateur uh, casual cynics as well. It's a very, very diverse um, philosophy which has infiltrated all sorts of, of layers of society. But we, we, can I just, that's fascinating actually, but what has come up in my reading of this, and what's come from what you uh, have, have said in your work, is the assertion is that uh, Jesus Christ was heavily influenced by the cynics, and uh, in what he, the way he, well, let, let me stop there, and you start there. Uh, John Mills, can you present the case for that? Right. Now, there are huge problems here, and it's immensely controversial. I mean, could Jesus speak Greek? How Hellenized was he? He could speak Greek. He could pun between Greek and Aramaic. He knew something about Greek culture. Were there real-life cynics that he could actually have met and observed? And there probably were in Gadara, which is about 20 miles away from Nazareth. Um, would it have been an anathema to a, 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 a devout Jew to observe these people and be influenced by them? Well, not necessarily, because there's a cynic, uh, in Emmaus, uh, about 120, who actually can be identified with a Jewish rabbi in the Talmud. Um, so there are sort of possibilities here, but you obviously have to look at specific cases to try and firm up the argument. And people quote things like, who is my mother, who are my brothers? And that is a rejection of family and an appropriation of the terminology of family uh, to the Jesus movement. And it's found exactly in cynicism. And it's shocking and outrageous in the Jewish tradition. Again, leave the dead to bury their 
de- de- dead is an astonishing uh, say, statement in a Jewish context, and there aren't really any parallels in the pagan context apart from in cynicism. And when Jesus tells his disciples how they should mission, he says, um, you're not to carry a purse with you, nor a satchel, you don't wear sandals. Um, there's a sort of compare and contrast uh, exercise going on, on there between Jesus and the disciples on the one hand and the cynics. And it would have been very difficult for people reading or hearing this not to think cynics. And so uh, uh, I think that the, the case that Jesus was to some extent influenced by cynicism is quite a compelling one. And obviously it, it has big consequences. I mean, it tells you something about the diffusion of cynicism. And it, it means that you have to read Jesus as a rather radical figure when he says, if you want to follow me, give out all your money to the poor, which is exactly what Crates did when he followed Diogenes. He means it. Christians should not finesse this. Mm. Angie, can you, do you think that a case put forward with, with, with his head ducked low by John Mills, but actually a very strong case. Do you think that holds water? Well, I think it, it might hold water. I mean, certainly there are... We know that uh, cynicism sp- had spread very widely throughout the, the Roman Empire, so it's, ex- it's very likely that Jesus would have encountered um, the odd wandering vagrant cynic. Um, and we, we know, and, and John has made persuasive case for the parallels... Um, whether that means that Jesus was influenced by cynicism seems to me another question. Um, as far as I'm aware, and I'm happy to stand corrected here, the, the first absolute watertight evidence we have of an interface between cynicism and Christianity is in the second century AD with Peregrinus, who um, was a Christian who then converted to cynicism while he was imprisoned in, in Palestine. Interesting that he converted to cynicism in Palestine. It shows that cynicism had clearly taken root in Palestine. And we know of other uh, writers who were interested in cynicism, such as the satirist Lucian, who allegedly started off speaking Aramaic. So we we know there are connections, but as far as I'm aware, it's the second century AD where we have absolutely clear evidence. But that doesn't mean to say that John's case is is untrue. Um, I I, I think the jury's out. Miriam. I, I would agree with that. Um, certainly the Peregrina story is, is very interesting because some people would argue that the influence is the other way, that by that time uh, it's quite clear that Christianity is, is well known and the similarities with cynicism are marked about property um, and about all men being brothers. Um, of course, there are differences, but and they're prepared to say that, that Jesus was a sophist. In other words, they compare him to a kind of preacher. And this business about the um, uh, Christians going around haranguing people uh, and, and appealing to the lower orders is obviously similar. But some people would say, for example, that the self-immolation of Peregrinus who burns himself on a pyre at Olympia um, can be seen as a martyrdom, uh, maybe a martyrdom like Socrates, maybe a martyrdom like Jesus. And when you read further on in Peregrinus that some days after uh, he was met, Pere- Peregrinus was marching along wearing white robes and a garland, and one thinks about the people who were at the tomb of Jesus after the resurrection, one begins to wonder which direction these stories are actually going. What one does feel, actually, is a lot of this is going to be coincidence, that Jesus was, after all, trying to change, to face the currency in his own way. I mean, he was challenging the legalistic approach of Judaism, uh, and he was emphasizing the spiritual values as opposed to um, the more material observance of of religion. Um, So why shouldn't there come to be a kind of coincidence? They're appealing to the same kind of people, the poor, the disadvantaged. It's difficult to say more than that. Do you want to come back, John? A little bit. Uh, a figure who, who might be inserted between Jesus and the, and the second century is St. Is Paul. And Paul, yeah. Because uh, it's demonstrable that uh, Paul uh, is greatly influenced by, again, diatribe style. And it's not his only style by any means. And it's even demonstrable that he's, he's read this utterly rubbishy uh, third century 
Greek uh, cynic author called Telles. So he knows some of this stuff. And more interestingly, sometimes Paul, who's all things to all men and has to project himself differently in different contexts and has to, of course, appeal to uh, new uh, uh, converts who are often Gentiles and awful Greeks, sometimes presents himself as a sort of cynic figure and defines himself in parallel and contrast with, with the cynic. So I think Paul is an important transitional figure. There's one big question I want to ask before we end, but can we just quickly tuck in, John, asking quite a lot, that the legacy of cynicism in satire, which yes. pushed right through the centuries, didn't it? it did, arguably yes. is still with us. <laughs> uh, right. Um, do you want to pick it up in the Renaissance with, say, Thomas More and uh, so on? Yes, utopias. I mean, utopias can be a way of talking about the cynic way of life because utopias uh, are sort of marginalised societies. Uh, they're often described in, in golden age uh, t- uh, terms. Um, the cynics themselves can construct utopias. Um, Moore's uh, utopia, I think, certainly has cynic uh, elements. I mean, the, the guide figure, Raphael, who also has this Greek name, which means purveyor of, of nonsense, uh, his sunburnt, and he's got a long beard, and he seems to have a cloak, uh, one, uh, a single cloak. He looks to me like a cynic, and when you read about the people of uh, Utopia, they are at home everywhere. We'll get sentiments like that. And that is cynic cosmopolitanism. And they have this peculiar marriage uh, custom that husbands and wives, for actually tying the knot, must see each other naked. And that is uh, more spin on the Crates Hipparchia. Uh, story. So at least, I mean, the how you sort of cast this out interpretively is very difficult, but at least it shows that cynicism is a vibrant thing. Well, we, well, we know Thomas More translated Lucian. Yes. And we know Lucian uh, is a satirist profoundly influenced by and interested in cynicism. So there is a, a very direct link yes, into there is, Thomas yes, More's yes, scholarship. Yes. Yeah. I've got to come to this, and there isn't enough time. Well, there is enough. Uh, Melanie Griffin, when did cynicism change its name to have the. Uh, change it. When did the word cynicism become what the, the used in the way we use it today? Well, it's a bit debated, but we do know that in the 19th century, the Germans, that systematic people, began to distinguish between <laughs> cynicism and zynicism. Um, that is, distinguish the, uh, the sort of modern sense of cynical. Uh, and that's, in a way, going just the opposite direction from these utopias. That is, it's taking the negative side and uh, applying it both to yourself. I don't uh, accept any of the values of society. Um, and also uh, to other people in which you say, I don't think anybody here really means what he says. It's all pretense, all their moral stance are all pretense. Underneath, they're all children of nature, taken in a very dark sense. Um, And the real difference between the old cynics and this modern cynicism is, I think, that however uncomplimentary the ancient cynics were about the way people behaved, their aim was to improve them, to get them to live better. They cared about them. They were in cities and they were uh, lecturing them, whereas the modern cynic in that sense just really despises people and think they all have the lowest motive uh, and probably ends up despising himself as well. I enjoyed that a lot. There isn't time for the sort of answers at the length and intensity that you've been given, and I've just blathered on for enough seconds for me to say thank you all very much to Miriam Griffin, <laughs> Angie Hobbs, and John Mills. And next week we'll be discussing Samuel Johnson and his circle of friends, and thank you very much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4.